Good afternoon. In chapter two of our 35 million view celebration, we are going to be talking a lot about habitations on Mars. How do you survive on such a large planet where you want to explore so many different regions of it? And yet, if you are tied to a single base, well, that's practically impossible. Well, NASA has a really intriguing and innovative plan. The idea is to take your habitat with you, regardless of where you might go. This is a habitat that can work in space. It can work on a rover. It can work on a temporary base that you can set up and tear down pretty easily. And it's perfectly sized to work with Starship. All of this and more coming at you on The Angry Astronaut right now. Good afternoon, and once again, welcome to another Angry Bulletin. Going to be talking about something we haven't discussed on this channel for quite some time, and that is the idea of how to survive on Mars. That is to say, how to build a habitat that's going to be resilient, that's also going to be mobile and easy to set up, easy to take down, and easy to utilize while you're trying to explore the surface of a admittedly enormous planet. I mean, even though Mars is one third the size of Earth, if you take out the size of the oceans, the surface area of Mars is actually roughly the same as the surface area of what we have here on Earth. So you're talking a vast planet with all kinds of different features that we would definitely want to explore with human missions. And this is going to be practically impossible if we root ourselves to one particular base or location. So at the International Conference on Environmental Systems, a JPL scientist named Scott Howe, actually he's an engineer, came up with an idea called a modular habitation system for human planetary and space exploration. And I'm going to be quoting extensively from this paper. Quote, as one of the recommendations prepared for the NASA Human Spaceflight Architecture Team, or HAT, Evolvable Mars Campaign, EMC, a compact modular system can provide a Mars forward approach to a variety of missions and environments. Small cabins derived from the system can fit into the space launch system. Now, of course, anything that can fit into SLS can also fit into Starship, but keep in mind anything that a JPL engineer recommends is going to have to work with SLS, at least currently, or can be mounted with mobility systems to function as pressurized rovers, in-space taxis, ascent stage cabins, or propellant trunks. Larger volumes can be created using inflatable elements for long duration, deep space missions, and planetary surface outposts. This paper discusses how a small diameter modular system can address functional requirements, mass, and volume constraints. So we're talking a one size fits all habitat. And I'll tell you something, it is very intriguing. So the horizontal modular exploration system concept consists of a uniform three meter diameter barrel with modular internal and external bulkheads and add on mobility, equipment racks, power, radiators, propulsion, tankage, and EVA elements. And in addition to habitats, rovers, and other elements, a modular lander system was also explored, resulting in an approach to propulsion that could be assembled in space and customized for various payload capacities. What the study did not cover, and there are gaps even in this system, is how such a system would fit into a Mars, Mars descent aero shell or other entry, descent, and landing concept. Of course, you could put it in Starship because Starship is designed to land on Mars. But first of all, let's examine how all of this gets deployed to Mars without Starship. As you can see here, all of the components can definitely fit inside the fairing of SLS, whether it be the cargo version or the trunk version, also known as the Universal Service Adapter that Dynetics is currently working on. All of these spaces could definitely 
accommodate all of the modules and even the landers that are being discussed here. And the lander that is proposed by JPL, keep in mind, this is way back in 2015, before Starship was even a thing, is called the Morpheus Lander. And interestingly enough, Morpheus was designed to be used with Methalox propulsion. And in this paper, a large thrust engine is currently being studied by the EMC lander team, but obviously a vacuum raptor could definitely suit the needs of this particular landing system. And all you do is add more engines and more propellant in order to land more payload. Of course, the big problem, as I mentioned before, is you need some sort of aero shell in order to deliver something this massive, otherwise it's just going to burn up in Mars atmosphere, even though it's a relatively thin atmosphere, it really doesn't matter. It can still burn up from orbit, so that would have to be explored. Maybe some sort of ambitious, lofted type of inflatable heat shield, but regardless, we're talking landers that can set down a payload as much as 40 metric tons at a time, which is pretty considerable, and also given how squat these things are, I would say that they could land pretty safely on the surface of Mars, and they land 100% propulsively. Now check out this intriguing idea called a habitank. What do you do with the fuel tanks on your various rockets that are still up in orbit once you've arrived? Now, if we are assuming 100% reusability, they could go back to Earth to get more cargo. But another alternative, if you don't want to send them back to Earth, because after all, you need to get a lot more propellant to send them back, is to instead put the empty fuel tanks on another lander, and once it arrives, turn it into a habit tank. In other words, all of these propellant and oxidizer tanks become new habitation modules that are set down on the Martian surface. They won't be particularly heavy because all their propellant will be gone, or the vast majority of it anyway. And then these are brand new habitation modules that you can make use of on the Martian surface very efficient use of resources. Now, as far as life support systems are concerned, this plan definitely advocates redundancy built into any habitat, but at the same time, there is no necessity to have life support systems included in every module. As long as the modules are attached to a core module that has all the life support in it, it's been found that that's really all you need. You don't need to have duplication of life support in every single module. That's very very important because the less space you use for life support, the more habitable space you have for the crew. And by the way, for those of you who think that Starship actually has over a thousand cubic meters worth of habitable space, it really doesn't. Any system, whether it's the ISS or any other spacecraft or space station, has at least 30% of its volume dedicated to life support and other systems, and only about 70% that you can dedicate to habitable volume. It may even be less than that. So any of these interior designs that you see that can handle 100 passengers are little more than fantasy when it comes right down to it. And that is the case with these modules as well. For example, the star node component, which is designed for short duration missions, have 8.1 cubic meters of habitable volume, but 6 cubic meters of non-habitable volume out of 14.1 total cubic meters worth of pressurized volume. Gets kind of complicated when you're comparing habitable volume to pressurized volume. In any event, the star module is also the space technology an advanced readiness node and it grew from previous concepts of small scale modules designed to be used in a variety of different short term missions if you're talking about rovers for example or space taxis vehicle cabins that sort of thing and then when you need more life support in other words maybe some more oxygen or some more water that sort of thing you go back to the core node which you're looking at 
at right now and recharge your life support and then go back out. Now, a closed loop life support system requires a lot more equipment. In other words, a life support system that recycles everything, the water, the air, etc. And so you probably only want those on your core modules because, as I said, it takes up a lot of space to have those kinds of life support systems. And on the star modules, as I said before, those are for more short-term missions. Now, while we're talking about these kinds of habitation modules, we also need to talk about extravehicular activity, because even though you can transfer straight from the base into one of these rovers or other exploration vehicles, sometimes you have to go outside. And so this paper also includes some interesting airlock concepts. For one thing, it points out out that in your airlock you don't want the same kind of atmospheric pressure that you have inside the base itself. If you were to include sea level pressure inside your spacesuit, if you went out onto the Martian surface or out into space for that matter, your suit would expand out so much that you wouldn't be able to operate. These are the sorts of problems that astronauts who first went on spacewalks encountered. So what is necessary? is to have an airlock with reduced pressure and then to have the astronauts adjust to that new pressure and then to transfer directly into their suits. And the reason you want that is you don't want any of the poisonous regolith on the surface of Mars to come into your habitat with you. And so transferring directly into your suits is really the only effective way to eliminate that. And there's also a secondary airlock between the suits and the outside to try to remove as much of the dust as possible before the suits are then reattached to the base. And this concept is extended also to a number of different vehicles, such as a Phobos hopper or a surface rover. Now, in the case of the surface rover, you can see it has a chariot mobility system to give it the maximum amount of ground clearance. And also, there's a front airlock that allows for direct access to your spacesuits and an area, again, where this dust can be removed before you go inside the star node where all your life support is and where you definitely don't want dust floating around in the atmosphere. So as you can see, these modules can be used for a wide variety of purposes, for a surface rover or for a rover that's flying around on the surface of Phobos. Same modules, same type of airlock, same type of direct access to your EVA suits, same everything. And I know I've shown you this illustration a number of times, but look at the similarity between these designs and their wide range of functions. One is designed to function on Phobos. Another one is designed to trundle around on the surface of Mars. Another one is designed to operate in zero G, utilizing reaction control thrusters. And then finally, the space taxi has an attached propulsion system to give it more delta V and more range. Four different vehicles, one common life support module. Really, it's very easy to even switch them all out. Have a look at this. You have the chariot. You also have something called the athlete for extreme terrain. You also have the RCS version and the version designed for in-space translation. So the hopper, the space version, and two different ground versions. And all you have to do is swap out the propulsion systems. The life support system or star module is exactly the same with the same amount of habitable, non-habitable volume and pressurized volume. Very, very efficient use of resources, duplicating the same types of systems across the board, whether you're out in space or on the surface of Mars. And since everything's in a vacuum, you really need very similar life support systems regardless of where you are. So let's look at some small scale habitats utilizing these types of modules to see how it all fits together. First of all, you have what's called the hard can outpost. This is my least favorite design. It 
it does have two rovers which is good you want to have lots of mobility but also only one core module and one habitation module for a total amount of habitable volume of only 97.4 cubic meters out of 203.9 total pressurized volume now why is it such a small percentage well because you have two rovers included in the equation so you're duplicating life support quite a bit and also there's no inflatable solution going with that to expand the habitable volume so you're looking at about 50 metric tons for a base and two rovers not too bad but still i think we can do better they also have the midex outpost which contains a core node and also two habitation modules and two rovers and an inflatable airlock for a total of 217.9 cubic meters of pressurized volume 140 or so of those being habitable that's a much better ratio something that i like a lot more and that it gets even better if you use inflatable modules you can have 238.4 cubic meters worth of pressurized volume with 159.7 cubic meters of that being habitable that is by far the biggest base that we've got and we are designing those sorts of inflatable modules right now so they could definitely be integrated into this solution now let's have a quick look at something for a phobos expedition utilizing hoppers instead of rovers this comes complete with a core node for life support with its own propulsion system a sky crane ascent descent stage if you will and also an attached excursion vehicle or hopper so you don't have to use your valuable propellant moving the entire base all over phobos instead you just take the hopper out when you want to explore other regions of the moon so when it comes right down to it this is probably my favorite idea for a mars base or at least it's the most original and innovative it doesn't waste any space it doesn't waste any equipment it makes the maximum use of everything you need to bring from earth which after all is the main objective here because the more you have to bring the more it's going to cost the cost per kilogram of getting anything from earth to mars even if you're using starship given how many times you have to refuel the thing well that's all going to add up to lots of money so weight in space is going to be at a premium so the more we can do with less the better the chance that we're going to become an interplanetary species sooner rather than later thank you very much for watching please don't forget to like and subscribe and i would also like to thank some of these amazing patreon folks that have joined recently timothy falk dave nick pearson cedric hunter james gibson peter stoyanov paul scott zeus 567 charlie anderson pedro john coke bon shaw ben rabau james workman don sander stephen higley stephen Yi, taylor knox burned elkman anthony dyson edward dolezal jens larson and there are still more so i want to make sure i recognize all of you and if you'd like to join these folks in making all of the journeys that i've been taking lately to give you unique content possible well you just go to the description and it'll give you all the details and in the meantime stay angry about space